Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Well, we have a really special episode today because we have with us Kate Berlant. And Kate is an Emmy-nominated comedian, actress, and writer. She recently concluded her fourth sold-out run of Kate, her one-woman off-Broadway play directed by Bo Burnham, to a rapturous response. Her comedy special, Cinnamon in the Wind, also directed by Bo Burnham, is now streaming on Hulu. And in addition, her A24 Peacock sketch comedy special, Would It Kill You to Laugh, Mm -hmm. created with her collaborator John Early, has been nominated for both a Critics' Choice and Primetime Emmy Award. Kate's film credits include Christopher Borgley's Dream Scenario, Olivia Wilde's Don't Worry Darling, and Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And we have brought Kate on the show today to talk about Dream Scenario, which is a film that, of course, everyone in my world immediately told me I had to watch. (laughs) And uh, we've all watched it and we loved it. And uh, it's a very Jungian film. I think it's also a very fun film. So we are delighted to have you here, Kate, to talk about this film and explore other uh, Jungian ideas with us today. Thank you for having me. I've already said this off air, but I'm a huge fan and genuinely starstruck to see you all three before me. So thank you for having me. And I'm in Jungian analysis now. I broke up with my old therapist very lovingly and respectfully. Um, So yeah, I just so appreciate your work. Great. And so how are you finding Jungian analysis? (laughs) I'm really enjoying it. And I really love, yeah, I mean, I've sort of, religiously was keeping a dream diary for about three years and then Mm -hmm. sort of have fallen off in the last eight months, but I'm allowing myself (laughs) to do that and go through the site, you know, and it's okay um, to be cyclical with, I mean, I guess everything, but uh, that's been so illuminating and helpful and yeah, just kind of exploring active imagination and um, Mm -hmm. yeah, just this, you know, living an archetypal life and Mm -hmm. all of that. It's just been very helpful for me. Shout out so, to James so, Hollis, too. Oh, yeah. Who I assume yes. listens. Yeah. <laughs> Every six months, I wake up in a cold sweat, and I'm like, I need to write a letter to James Hollis to say thank you, and then I never oh. do, but I'm, I'm going to oh. do it. Well, you just, you just did. <laughs> I just did. Yeah, thank we'll you. Sure, we'll, we'll make sure he hears this episode. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm curious, since you've been interested in dreams for a while, like when this project came up, Dream Scenario, you know, was that, was it especially interesting? Did it provoke a lot of uh, curiosity on your part? Well, I feel the need to also just clarify for any listener who hasn't seen it. I've got about one scene in the film. So I just want to be clear. I'm not the, I'm not the spine of the film. I was very excited by the, by the film. Chris Borgley is such a fascinating filmmaker and I really loved his short films, which did you happen to see sick of myself? It's his feature that he did right before this. Um, that I think you would be very intrigued by as yeah. well. And his okay. com- his comedy is so psychological and you know has these elements of absurdity, but they're always grounded in this deep sincerity and this sort of like mm. internal um, obsession with behavior. And it, I just really love his, his work. Um, and this, I mean, I was also so thrilled for him that this is, he bought Nicolas Cage, you know, a huge, movie yeah. star. And I love I love Nicolas Cage and it's it's funny with this film because Nicolas Cage is such an archetype like already he sort of we already kind of have been dreaming about him our whole lives because he's in these yeah. movies that have right. you know carried really for iconic. so long. Yeah. 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 So that was really interesting to me and yeah, the performances in the movie are are so great and I was just really impressed. And also I mean he you know he wrote it directed it and edited it wow. which is totally <laughs> 
obsessive wow. and impressive. So he um he pulled it off. And it was so fun. It was like very easy yeah. and breezy on set. <laughs> Well, why don't you just tell us the the premise of the movie for yes. people who haven't seen it? Okay, great. My instant panic. I haven't seen it in a second, but yeah, I love it. Um, you can fill in that it might be fresher for you. Oh, I'm just supposed to be the actress. It just kind of ha ha comes in and adds an anecdote. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but um, so Nicolas Cage plays this kind of everyman character, mm-hmm. right? Who's... Um, uh, a professor and you know living this sort of suburban esque like life, and what happens is that he start people start um, dreaming about him. He starts to be this persistent figure in um, dreams, and it starts out who's it begins with his um, his students, his right? Young, like there's sort young, of this. Like, it starts with his youngest daughter. Oh right, of course, yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's like this collective experience. Um, that sweeps the nation and I guess the world, and he becomes mm-hmm. this world. this this celebrity. Um, and what, of course, then happens is you know he becomes this kind of living god in a way, and he's kind of getting high on his own supply on the celebrity. And yep. suddenly, oh my god, is is he going to be able to sleep with younger women? And is he is he going to make money off being um, you know perhaps attached to some sort of brand? And then, of course, he has to be totally cannibalized and destroyed and turned into a monster and um he experiences this like fall from grace from this mm-hmm. kind of surreal celebrity um i think that was perfect ish <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> um, yeah 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 so so it it picks up on some really current themes like you know there's a way that um Going viral in dreams is kind of a an analogy for going viral on social media, mm-hmm. and and this kind of very uh, superficial kind of influencer culture. By the way, I just want to say that we've had many listeners report to us that we appear in their dreams, <gasps> and so that term, that term our, our, that's used in the film, dream influencer. Yeah, I think we need to claim well, there that. You are. hashtag hashtag dream influencer. I don't Where's know. Where's the merch? Maybe we're- Maybe we're nightmare <laughs> images. <laughs> After all, that happened in dream scenario. So <laughs> that would be so course. funny to dream about. It's so literal. It's like kind of embarrassing when your dreams are so literal. You know, They're it's just never like really literal. I, though. Of course, of course. When they feel it, you're like, oh, of course. Like my dad handed me a key, and I couldn't find where the, <laughs> it went. You know, or whatever. No, yeah. no, no. I have to tell you, Kate. We love those dreams, right? <laughs> yeah. They're like they're big softballs. They're, they're helpful. Yeah, they're helpful. Yeah. But it also picks up on these deeper themes too. Yeah. And also, the, yeah. your life, Kate. I imagine just as a celebrity, as oh, your face is. Enters into, <laughs> enters into the collective. Yeah. And um, my understanding is, is that a lot of celebrities also have that experience of not being able to go out in public and have any sense of privacy, this, this um, destruction of, of private life and how, how mm. frightening that uh, can be. I guess people think it's going to be exciting, but how frightening it can be. So I'll claw my way to... To that um yeah i but I, I understand what you're saying in terms of and i think you mentioned social media and of course this kind of we live in this world now where even non-actors are sort of forced to perform for social media or it's become naturalized to kind of be constantly sharing yourself and mm-hmm. um i had that experience just the other day i was at the the grocery store i almost called it the market i'm often um, made fun of for calling grocery store the market like it's the most bourgeois thing you can possibly <laughs> to be like I was at the market Whole Foods um, but I do say that I think I inherited that from my mother but I saw this guy who like I had seen recipes he had posted you know just this kind of like the endless yeah, yeah. scrolling that you do and then mm-hmm. you get and I was like oh it's him you know and I yeah, like yeah. had the and it was this like that is to say like the the nature of celebrity has change so wildly and mm-hmm. i feel i occupy this very nice place where i am not famous with a capital f but i'm but people usually when they know me it's because they like my work it's not because they hate me mm. <laughs> which i think is um 
because to I when I was a child, I used to sort of dream of fame and this like you you know you want to be like hugely famous, and now yeah, yeah. truly it's a curse. It's like it takes so much more than it gives. I mean, it's just yeah. like this real sort of nightmare. And so uh, that being said, <laughs> I'll, you know, try it. But um, I think that <laughs> it's, um, y- yeah, there's um, the, the, now we're so, the, the, I guess sometimes you've, yeah, that feeling of like, oh yeah, you're being perceived or something. Is, mm-hmm. Or the, the intimacy, particularly with comedy, or I'm sure you feel this with the podcast, like even just hearing you guys, it's like, oh, that's sort of like, this, per- this voice that's in your head that's sort of, you know, carrying you throughout your day. It's intensely intimate. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, but, but I, I mean, I, I feel lucky. I'm in the good zone. Like I said, people don't, aren't, don't um, know me because they hate me. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting point. Of course, like point. really famous people, that's, yeah, yeah. That, that, that if, you're, if, if a certain level of fame just attracts almost sometimes people that just kind of want, want to hate you or want to take you down or something. Oh, like yeah. That. And of course, that happens in the movie yeah. where he, his fame brings this unwanted attention. You know, there's a, um, a, a psychiatrically ill person who breaks into his house in the middle of the night, and there's all these unintended consequences. Uh, but, but he buys into the whole fame uh, opportunity there. He, there's a way that he reminds me of Icarus, and he flies too high. And he gets burned. Mm. And I wondered about that in, in the film, of uh, his delight in his sudden uh, fame and uh, accolades and being the center of attention, of, and, and how and if, you know, there was an effect to that, that then the images in people's dreams turned negative, um, analogous to Icarus's fall from the sky. Uh, so there is a whole through line about fame. Certainly. And even like the, one of the funniest things to me is his, you know, his desire to be invited to this very exclusive dinner, like, you know, mm-hmm. this, like <laughs> this professor who, and like, and just, yeah, yeah. and and that is like so human and so familiar. Yes. And then mm-hmm. of course, kind of like, finally you get there and then it's like your presence actually is this huge, causes this rupture and your, um, yeah. and yeah, the fear, um, I, Uh my, um, you know, I think it's like fame, like prestige. It's like even among chimps, right? Or it's like, Mm -hmm. like, (laughs) but it's like that, like the fight for prestige and like the highly, like the hierarchical structure is so um, pervasive. But that even, I think that's the word that is used that's really interesting is like, it's prestige, like that even animals like are, you know, vying for that and aware of that. And he starts to get it. And then of course it's so funny because he's like, well, I want to channel that into my, my academic work and mm-hmm, get people mm-hmm. excited about my book. And it's like, of course not. You know, maybe your image will be used for a Sprite ad if you're lucky. Um, right. Yeah. He's naive. <laughs> I mean, he is really yeah. kind of, a, he is kind of a man child. Mm-hmm. And yeah. in that way is kind of being yes. uh, savaged by this world that he did not choose to be thrust into. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the other analogy is he's a zebra. Mm-hmm. And uh, the character he plays is an evolutionary biologist. Is that that's right? And um, so he's talking about how the stripes on zebras uh, don't camouflage them against the environment, but uh, they camouflage them against predators. Because all a predator, all a lion will see is all these stripes, and can't identify an individual zebra to pounce on. And so zebras only get into trouble when they stick their necks out, mm-hmm. which is exactly mm-hmm. what that character does. Or the he foreshadowing, sticks his neck that, out. foreshadowing that one of the students says, unless you want to mate, and then, right. and then you right. kind of want yes. to stick yes. out with your mating dance, right. and yes. then that foreshadows <laughs> his hilarious, oh. unbelievably tragic attempt at oh. mating dance, <laughs> which is just... It's so, so, it's so hard to watch. to watch. I know. So painful. <laughs> uh, iconic scene. Yeah. Yeah. Deliciously cringy. You know, um, so, so some of the things I was thinking about, and this relates to the zebras, is there, there are these two human needs. We both desperately need to feel like we fit in and belong, and we want that prestige. We want to yeah. stand out. And I, I think the, the film kind of looks at, 
both of those desires and and his name is Paul and uh, <laughs> you know he he desperately wants to stand out there's this thing about you know he has been conducting he conducted this he had these ideas in graduate school but he never really did anything with them and then this other uh, kind of colleague has gone ahead and done all this research and she's getting it published in nature and um <laughs> And, yeah. you know, one of the things is he wants to be famous without having done the work. Yeah. He ha he's had the ideas. He says, oh, I have a book, but he hasn't ever written anything. So right. he's like, I, so I it's, it's, it's like I, read, I wrote it, right? Or he says something right. like that. Like, well, I had the idea, so it's eventually right. published. Right. Yeah. Right, right. So, yeah. so there's, there's the sense that, you know, hey, if you're going to stand out, you, you'd better do the work. Because otherwise, you're, you're just standing out for something really kind of silly and fatuous and you could be savaged with it but he wants evidence that he is creative and talented mm -hmm. and he wants that evidence to be concrete in the world but he is legitimately stolen from in the last yeah, scene where yes, she coins yeah. she a term that term. he had invented yeah. which was a substantive and substantive enough to forward the, uh, the career of the competitor um, but because he had not laid claim to that in a way yes. that the evidence of his of his intelligence could be linked to him, that then it becomes an object that can be taken by another mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. So there's a danger in hiding, because when we hide, there's a way in which the public does not know that we have ownership of our own creativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or as Robert Bly said, your gold, showing your gold. Mm. So Nicolas Cage, who who might have had some gold in his personality fails to share his gold or to let anyone see his gold, which mm. brings up that other question of who was he such that bringing his gold forward was either so shameful or so frightening. Mm -hmm. And I think like a lot of us in the world, having anyone see our gold, psychological gold, and subjecting it to other people's opinions other people's desires to monetize it or to change it in one way or another can be very frightening. Mm -hmm. And we can be extremely ambivalent about that. Well, also because when we show our gold, we have a kind of a responsibility to it that might really make demands on us. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you know, hypothetically, if Paul had shown his gold and tried to write about this, he might have he might have really had to harness his, you know, psychic energy in service to doing this research. Instead, you, you get the feeling he's kind of coasted, you know. He hasn't really had to put a lot of effort in. He sort of probably you get the feeling he teaches the same class year after year. <laughs> so so there's a way that he maybe was uh reluctant to let his ideas make a demand on him and he he just wanted the payoff, you know. He he just wanted the, the quick connection that he was looking for from your character, Kate, of, you know, hey, you guys are going to set me up with a publisher, right? Yeah. And, and, no, how about yeah. a Sprite commercial? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. So this is something I was truly kind of talking about last night. You're talking about like that goal, like the weight of that gold also yes. in the psyche and which I know you've, you've mentioned before on the, on the show, but just when you fail to, to do that for whatever reason, um, yeah, how distorting that can be to your, to your life and how painful. And, and von Franz takes something forward, which is also in the uh, Gnostic Gospels from Nag Hammadi, that if we bring what is in us forward, mm -hmm. that there is a kind of blessing. But if we fail to bring what is inside of us forward, it becomes a poison. Yep. Mm. So <gasps> at I love some that. point, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. The talent will hurt us if we don't give it breathing room, if we don't let it come to life at some point. So I'd like to personalize this for a certain moment. You're a talented person. You're funny. You're creative. You had to make that decision that your talent is talking to you and pressing on you as a young mm -hmm. person. How did you navigate that decision of when you would let other people see your gold? And mm. when you felt that you needed to hide it until a certain point? I think I started very young, which is deeply mm. helpful. Like I did stand mm -hmm. up for the first time when I was 17. Wow. So I think I was still 
um, I mean, I was had always been the class clown, and I always felt very much from when I was extremely young, like I want to be an actor. I want to, and I just that was my the way I moved through the the world was just being um, a clown and a ham, and so mm-hmm. that's my identity was so firmly formed around that, for better or for worse. And so <laughs> I, but I from a very so I I started yeah when when I was seventeen, and I think that really served me because. Also, just the pain tolerance. I mean, when I think about it now, I'm like, how did I do that? Yeah. I had to get a fake yep. ID to go do open mics, like the Laugh Factory on Sunset Boulevard at 5.30 oh in God. the afternoon on Tuesdays. I mean, it was like, Jesus. and I was the youngest by far. It was mostly, it was, you know, men. It was all men. Um, and I somehow was able to force myself into that Um my best friend, Sammy Birch, was by my side waiting for me, which really helped. Um, and mm. so I had that support, but I, um, I don't think I could have, I think so often when people wait longer and their identities or egos are more formed or something, then it just becomes far too terrifying. And so mm-hmm. because I started so young, um, that and my- You started yeah. before you evaluated the different consequences. Right? Totally. You, yeah, you just yeah. you were already leaping off the cliff, like the tarot card of the fool, kind of. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You ha- you have yeah. to be, and so I sort of did that, almost like self hypnosis of just like this is what I'm gonna do, and this is I'm deciding that this is who I'm gonna be, and this is gonna be what my what my life is about, and so I, yeah, I just did it. I I, I just think that is what I did. I never really saw it turning out a different way. So and it was very hard. And I have to, yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say, I also, you know, my father's a visual artist. So we, like, I, I can't pretend it's not like, well, my parents were locksmiths and they told me, don't you <laughs> dream of Hollywood, little girl. You know, it's like I grew up in a house in which, you know, my dad, well, you know, mm. this was made available to me, th- this idea of like, oh, you can be an artist well, and you can, you know, so, but so- yeah. We have a personality that's in the front of the house, you know, that's that's right there in the proscenium of the stage. But then we have the personality that's, you know, in stage left behind the curtain. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering if that other side of you, the the other voice in you is coming out in other ways, for instance, perhaps in your writing or in other dimensions of your creative life that isn't the 17-year-old girl who's, you know, the vaudevillian, you know, out there in the front. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the show that I have been doing, um, which is called Kate, is sort of this, all my work tends to, you know, it's this idea like you're doomed to make the same painting over and over again, or like the same mm-hmm. movie over and yes. over again. And, and so yeah. I, I kind of can't get away from like, oh yeah, I'm sort of always, my work is sort of always about performance or about the nature mm-hmm. of the performing self or these sort of like liminal, liminoid, <laughs> you know, like... Um, <laughs> like the self as that sort of creature in my own, uh, there's always a sort of like meta element that I can't get away from. And this show, because my standup is also highly improvised, this show was my attempt to, which was, it was a huge personal mm-hmm. challenge. Like I'm actually going to try to write something. And that was kind of this, right. there was a lot of fear going into that. Like of course, of like, mm, like it was like unfamiliar technology of the self for me to like try mm-hmm. to write and kind of adhere to some kind of, Aristotelian logic, like, okay, what if I tried to write a story where there something happened? Wow. And and then of course I ended up well, I ended up writing the show that is sort of about myself, but also not about myself in this kind of um um I think because stand up is such a is seen as a sort of confession, you know, and this um performance mm-hmm. of confession, I've always resisted that and my stand up has always like kind of not has always not been about myself. But mm-hmm. I've also always felt that performance is just inherently so vulnerable it's you up there whether or not you're talking about your you know childhood like it's still you it's still the material of your mm-hmm. your like, psyche in life like and the so things that you create and fantasize are still coming out of you yeah <laughs> so, completely yeah, so yeah. i've always kind of been almost like baffled there is this there's this real cultural particularly now like insistence on authenticity and truth and like revealing your trauma in this very cogent straightforward way um where but I'm even like, that's a narrative, right? Yes, of course. So I'm like, well, it's yeah. all, when, and and this idea of like the sort of person on stage is like bearing their heart to you, and 
it's like, well, they're in a costume. They decided what to wear. You know, it's like every, the body on stage is always this performance, even when it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, doing this. And I've always been fascinated by that performance of like the stripped down truth. Like that's always seemed so strange mm -hmm. to me and kind of um, not that there isn't a way to be authentic on like I. I've never under, like, I've always used artifice. There was, there was something that um, I remember reading when I was 18 um, that really helped mm -hmm. me, which was, I think it was, and I've been trying to find this. Someone maybe can find it for me. It's like Carl Dreyer, the filmmaker. He was writing about the making of Ordet, or he was right, and he said something about using artifice to strip artifice from artifice, mm -hmm. um, which, like, and that really clicked for me. And I was like, oh, that's exactly what I find funny. That's like my, that's what I do or that's what okay. I relate to. And so, yeah, artifice has always for me been the way in because that is what life actually, that, that's mm -hmm. more real than reality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in a way. Right. But it's also the symbolic because yes. the artifice is the artifact and mm -hmm. the artifact is, is some kind of a representative mm -hmm. object that is indirectly or symbolically related to a larger reality. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it reveals mm -hmm. even while it conceals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, like every symbol. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the performance is a symbol of something greater, even though yeah. what is visible, the art, yeah. is just the, also like, the gate. And this kind of idea of like the mask, like, you know, there's this idea of, oh, the performer wearing the mask and then the place where you see the skin of the act of the actor and then <laughs> you're aware of that slippage and so that mm -hmm. kind of like slippage has always been to me what's interesting or just where i go mm -hmm. and like what i kind of mm -hmm. can't get away from <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, why people yeah. love when uh, like saturday night live people are doing a skit and then somebody just laughs uncontrollably like the audience right. just yeah. howls to see the slip and even yeah. perhaps more fascinating when the laughter is fake Ah, the artifice of the artifice. Yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or when it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. There's a lot. Mm. So swinging back to dream scenarios. Okay, yes, thank you. parallel processes, which is why I had brought that up. Because mm -hmm. I think that what's happening uh, yeah. here, what's happening in your life, perhaps, what's happening in everyone's life, which has to do with public and private life. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and how... Um, we are so massively affected when the collective turns this enormous eye of Sauron, you know, onto us and the voltage that, oh. that evokes in the individual's psyche, let alone the ramifications of how other people will treat us. And I was thinking about the idea of anonymity. So uh, anonymity is to not have a name. Versus mm -hmm. to be nominative, which is when you have a name. And in ancient Egypt, in their mythology, to have the name of someone is to be able to command their soul. So mm -hmm. when we can walk down the street and no one knows our name, there's a way in which our power still belongs to us. Yep. But as people found this man's name, his power and virtue began to leave him, and he changed and began to be under the control and the weird sway of other people. Somehow, if that's done um, carefully, something good can happen. Isis steals the name of the sun so that she can get the secret of resurrection to resurrect Osiris. But here, his name has been so stolen by some force, forced out of him that he does not understand yeah and is totally indifferent to him, and he is subject to, which also not only is part of that Egyptian piece, it leans into the idea of Job, where the gods <laughs> are playing dice, and you're on the table. So I'm just wondering about that. I'm wondering about how our name can be co-opted, and then we are controlled. And I wonder about the idea of how we orient to forces that are so much larger than us that we cannot control. Well, there's something here too, I think, about the way that the character, Nicolas Cage's character, becomes identified with people's projections of him. 
And of course, that <laughs> can absolutely happen if we're famous too. You know, people pro- people project stuff on famous people, and you know, you you run you run a great risk when you become identified with what gets projected on you. So, in in the very first opening scene, it, it, you know, what one of the other fun things about this film is that there's so many dreams that are um, depicted, which is always which is always great, and they do a wonderful job with it too. Someday I want us to do an episode on like our favorite TV <laughs> and film dreams, but for another time. But anyway, the film opens with this dream of his youngest daughter in which she is in distress and he does nothing. He just keeps raking the leaves. Yes. And that is a theme yeah. in the beginning that he, he keeps on appearing in people's dreams and not doing anything. <laughs> and he says to his daughter, that's not how you see me, right? Remember the time that I... You, you were drowning and how fast I ran. And, and it, you know, it's sort of like you can hear the false note right from the beginning that he assumes that, uh, that what is depicted in his daughter's dream is somehow representative of how she sees him or mm-hmm. even of who he actually is. You know, and, and we always have to try to m- make sure that we keep that space between, between how other people see us and what they project on us and who, who we really are. I'm thinking about projective identification, which of course the erotic scene is all about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then projective identification, not only do people project things on us, which can happen without any kind of relationship. Kate, people see your films and they see pictures of you and they have whatever they want to project, but because they're not talking to you, you may or may not have any awareness or effect on that. But if you're actually in a relationship with somebody, there's a way in which they want to push their projection into you and then really manhandle you to prove that they're right. Well, and that that, happens several times in the film. That's exactly what I was saying. And so wonderfully with that erotic scene, so this, um, and I really love the way that actress did her work. Yes, she was great. It was amazing because- Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you're in that scene, and that's the scene you're also in, Kate, where they're in the middle of this um, marketing, you know, blitz and this attempt to get him signed on. And so that's going on. But then this smoldering sexuality is happening in one of the people in the room. And the way she's looking at him and then inviting him over to the house and really, uh, really manipulating him. And she's like, no, 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 no. You have to stand in the corner. You have to stand in the dark. Don't say any words because you've got to be the fantasy. And, yeah, and I, he, in this nebbishy way, he's like, oh, oh okay, okay. Um, but I think what's, what's, I, I don't think he's terribly inflated. I think he's curious. Um, I think he looks frightened the whole time. He doesn't seem inflated at all. And then, yeah. you know, as this beautiful woman just, you know, touches him, he immediately ejaculates and then farts. <laughs> so, which is that marvelous, in a certain sense, self saving instinct in his <laughs> psyche because he doesn't get inflated. And that what happens is his own body refuses to take on the inflation and he is just a mm. creature yeah, in but- the room. But see, Joseph, though, I would say that, it, you know, because what happens at that point is he is so humiliated and there is just this kind of rage that comes with um, this humiliation that, uh, and this impotence, you know, he's so, he's so unable to kind of make anything happen. And that is when the dreams turn dark. It's like that, that, um, that, that rage at his own impotence begins to infect the dreams. And, that, and it, it starts again with his youngest daughter who has this dream of him right. charging into her bedroom. And then all of the dreams are showing him being, you know, completely sadistic. And I think that that sadism is in him because he has this frustrated, uh, you know, desire to, to take on this inflation. And then yes. he does that terrible cringy apology, which is also very inflated. You know, it's all about Amazing. me, me, me. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I think, I think he has yeah. gotten sort of carried away with it. And, and, and there, yeah. there is a kind of, um, yeah. not taking responsibility for your shadow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Hello, listeners. I want to take just one minute to remind you about my upcoming women's fairy tale and yoga retreat. We have just a few tickets left. It is April 25th through April 28th in central Pennsylvania. It's a beautiful time of year to be there. It's a great group of women. We have a ton of fun. We hang out. We do yoga. We talk about fairy tales. We eat good food. Uh, We tell stories and share poems around the campfire. Uh, We do some dream incubation. It's a really great time. So if you're interested, pop on over to my website, lisamarciano.com, where you can read more about Women's Wellspring Retreat. Thanks. I think there is a way that he wants to uh, take on uh, the, all of the favorable projections. And he, he wants to do it sort of vicariously. And so he goes along for the ride, and all of a sudden his classroom is filled up with people because he's appearing in dreams. So he has the magic, the charisma, the mana moment. And then he does it again with the young woman uh, where he wants to be able to take it on without, just like the book, without actually having done the work. And I like your point, Lisa, about his impotence um, because he says to his daughter, you know, but I wouldn't just stand there and watch, I'd do something, right? And then later he says the same thing when the dreams turn dark, but but I wouldn't cut off your toes. You don't really think that I would do that, do you? Uh, so he's wrestling with how is he seen? How can he then see himself? And what can he embrace and live into, you know, in his, in his uh, waking world? Uh, but he's a victim. Well, uh, even he, though I will say, I want to go into, um, well, you go ahead, Joseph, and then at some point, I want to talk about all the cancel culture piece of this yeah, film, yeah. which, that was, which that I was thought great. was just yeah. great. If we see the movie as a, a purely subjective dream, that, mm-hmm. that Nicolas Cage is actually dreaming the entire movie, <laughs> what he comes in touch with is that that rageful, strangling energy inside of him is why his life has not been successful. Yeah. That he has this book idea, but Mm -hmm. he has an inner strangler that is choking off his ability to be creative. Mm -hmm. So that's already been, you know, well established in his personality. It becomes visible, as all of you are saying, to the dreams of other people. And this again goes to this idea of projective identification. These energies start getting put into other people. I guess my feeling is I have such a hard time thinking that he's inflated. Because often when people are inflated, there is such a sense of overconfidence. And my sense is that in all of these environments, and even during the date, he is just shaking in Mm -hmm. his boots. Yeah, He's like a kid on a first date. He's 14. And, you know... Someone kissed him and he had a premature ejaculation, unlike um, <laughs> that kind of striding, strutting kind of energy. So, so it may be that there is a missed opportunity for an inflation that might have helped him, helped him mm-hmm. feel big enough to, to take on what was happening. But at all opportunities, he and his unconscious kept shrinking. I don't want a Sprite commercial, which maybe might have given him millions of dollars. I want my book on ant intelligence to be published. That's all I want. Mm-hmm. Well, I just want to have an experiment on a date with a beautiful woman. And he's a tr- yeah, but, you know. but he, he feels entitled. He feels entitled to, you know, have a conversation with Obama. He feels yes. entitled to, you know, try to have this um, sexy scene with this girl. He feels entitled to have the whole world feel sorry for him because he's been a victim. But, it, yeah. you know, Joseph, what I, what I really like what you're saying about how he has an inner strangler, I think that's just right. And, uh, and one of the most important scenes in the film, I think, is when he has a dream mm-hmm. of being hunted by himself. Um, yeah. right. mm-hmm. Because it is a real image, I think, Joseph, just like you're saying, of yeah. uh, his own um, sort of self-sabotaging, yeah. you know, the way he's just sabotaged himself throughout his life. He sabotaged his career. He sabotages his marriage. He sabotages. I love the teen daughters. 
I, mean, I think the funniest move, yeah. funniest uh, the, the <laughs> scene in the film is when the oldest daughter is watching his cringy apology on YouTube and she says, I'm going to have to kill myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just, so, so, but he, he, um, he, he, he does have that inner predator who, who is very much uh, going after himself. And I think that image of him with arrows sticking out of his body, I kept asking myself, is this an Acteon moment? I thought, no. But it is a little bit of a St. Sebastian moment. Huh. <laughs> because he does go online and says, I'm being martyred mm -hmm. um, unfairly. And that um, famous image of St. Sebastian being tied <laughs> to a post and these arrows being shot into him. Uh, although he can't quite take on the exultation of being martyred, there's still this uh, complaint of, of fate. There, there's no amor fati in, in mm -hmm. any of this. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the, the way he's actually sort of like driven into this, as you said, sort of the comment on his cancellation and watching him go through this. And then he's driven into this like actual underworld of him. One of my favorite moments in the film is when he's, you know, doing this book tour and it's, you know, really pathetic. Oh. And I'm trying to remember the detail of his book has been translated into French. Yes. And it's oh, like, yes. Been, yes. there's this mistranslation or what, or, you know, he gets It was there supposed to be called dream scenario and it wound yeah. up being called Je suis ton cauchemar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then he's down there and it's like, you know, he's this pariah at this point, and it's this kind of like creepy group of people who are gathering in this basement. And then he's sitting there for his book signing, which is a huge failure, and, you know, no one's arrived, and he's down there in the basement, and just the lighting fixture from the ceiling just dismounts and oh. hits him on the head. Like this right. punishment just is mm -hmm. so funny. Mm -hmm. But the gods have given him something, and now the gods are torturing him in the same measure. Mm hmm but, you know, I'm going back to what you said before, Joseph, about, you know, in a way, a, a, a comedic analogy to Job of the price of innocence, the price of naivete, the price of not grabbing hold of your life with more consciousness is that you get taken for a ride. Mm -hmm. Things just happen to you, mm -hmm. um, you know. Uh, and you don't know why, and it doesn't make any sense. And then when you're doing a book signing, even a light fixture falls down from the ceiling and bangs you uh, a good one in the forehead. Uh, and he goes through the film with things just happen to him. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> but, but much like Job, because some people yeah. say that Job's flaw is that he was a, a good scholar of Torah, that he, he was yeah. knowledgeable and he was obedient to the laws, but actually did not have a living relationship to mm -hmm. the self or to the inner worlds, and that that was not adequate. And so right. Cage's um, character has this PhD mental life mm -hmm. of some kind. Mm -hmm. Maybe yes. it's iterative. But he does have real skill. I mean, he got, he got a PhD and he's, he's a professor, which is not an easy thing to do, and he's tenured. So he has this life of mind, and as we've seen, not a lot of libido. He's not a terribly sexy guy. His body doesn't have a lot of energy. He's not concerned about his appearance. Um, his wife is really um, is wonderfully patient and kind of generous with him, actually. Mm. So he's kind of there at that beginning of the Job story, and yeah. then the gods notice mm -hmm. him. And as always happens, when the gods notice you, they fuck with you. Like, <laughs> Don't stand it's, out from the crowd. <laughs> whether it's Yahweh Don't. or whether it's Zeus or That's Apollo, right. that when right. the archetypal forces turn their eye to the ego, some crazy stuff is going to happen. Yeah. Very unpredictable. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what happens is his ego is flattered and seduced, and he's the center of attention. You know, and the marketing people say, you know, you're the most famous person in right. the whole world right now. It's like, whoa. You're the most interesting <laughs> person, right? Right, yeah. right. right. Most interesting. Uh, uh, that if, if you buy into all this with your ego, 
Watch out. Well, and there is also a very subtle comment um, that the marketers, and Kate, this was your scene there, where the marketers are curious that if they stick a can of Sprite in Nicolas <laughs> Cage's hand, will then everyone dream of what he has in his hand, mm -hmm. which is really goes back to the whole underpinnings of marketing mm -hmm, in the United mm -hmm. States, that, that it was Freud's nephew, actually, who was reading his books and had this insight that if we understood the unconscious mind, we could manipulate a nation. And his first task, which was successful, was a campaign to convince women that they should smoke cigarettes. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's, there is that moment is happening in the room, which is, hey, we've got a door into people's unconscious minds, and right. what can we do to turn them from citizens into consumers of Sprite? Which also <laughs> reminds me of just the sort of like the absolute elimination of private space mm -hmm. because of social media and just yep. every moment being mm -hmm. co-opted. And, yep. and, 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 I mean, yeah, that's all. Let's let that hang out there. How, you know, how terrifying. Well, but, but yeah, but that, <laughs> it's like, it yeah. is totally terrifying. And that's definitely, I think, one of the big themes that the film is exploring is, yeah, like what, what happens when they can just be inside your head at any moment. And in fact, you know, there's the, 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 uh, the Norio is created out of the, the experience with, that Paul Matthews has where they, they create this device that will allow you to insert yourself and then there's in, into other people's dreams and then they can use it to, you know, there's product <laughs> placement in your dream. Yeah. So you're having a dream and all of a sudden, you know, it's like, oh, there's this pair of sneakers, you know? So um, it, it is, uh, and, and you, you know, I, th I think you're absolutely <laughs> right. There is this total collapse of sort of interiority in our culture. Or that and it's I nothing, think, it's not to be explored, it's just to be mined. Or that yeah. they're, even your <laughs> dreams, you shouldn't be, re you, right. that rest shouldn't even, or doesn't need to exist. Yeah. And I would say that that may be <laughs> where the gods turn on him, because he's mm -hmm. been granted this access to, to the collective unconscious. He's become yeah. a, a figure in the collective, and instead of being humble and being in a state of wonder that the gods have chosen him, is seduced in this very satanic way. I mean, it's uh, it's that moment where Jesus is being tempted in the desert. It's like, you know, just bow down before me, and whatever you want, buddy, I I'll give it to you. And it's in that temptation, because that he falls, and I think he's not the one who mentions Obama. Doesn't someone? Hey, to yeah, somebody else in the room. I mentioned yeah. Obama. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, it's well, just like spitting ideas and, oh, we could maybe we could get Obama to dream about you. Wouldn't that be cool? Right. So it, <laughs> yeah. it, it may have been hubris that he took, he took the serpent's <laughs> apple, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. he, he, all, everyone in the room is tempting him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with these yes. various yes. things. But it wasn't really his idea. He just, you know, he looked at Molly, your character. Yeah, yeah. And, and he bit the apple. Mm -hmm. And so the seductive, the seductress um, invites him. Uh, Molly, Kate, says the apple of influencing heads yeah. of state. And I thought that moment where the, the mm -hmm. chief executive in the room. Mike Sarah, see about Mike Sarah, yeah. yeah. Mike Sarah, he feels that he's, he's lost. Um, mm -hmm. He's lost. Um, the main character there, and then he turns his back. I thought that was such a really interesting cinematic moment. What, whatever he is, is going on in his mind, and everyone else in the room is just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. So, Kate, from your perspective, what do you make of that transition in the movie? Mm -hmm. That moment of him turning away and... Turning away... Yeah. And then coming back and trying to hook mm -hmm. uh, Nicholas Cage yeah. in a different way, land yeah. a different hook in his mouth. Well, I think it sort of amplifies this joke of that there could be any kind of sincere or emotional, like this is mm -hmm. about money, right? Like this is just, right. they, they don't actually care about this guy and they certainly don't care about his academic 
world or hit you know hit any of his actual <laughs> aspirations right. they see him purely as this like vessel for capital maybe <laughs> and so there's like this performance of michael Serif kind of doing this performance of an apology of like you know what? i'm sorry i feel like i haven't appealed to you in the right way like let me gather mm-hmm. my forces as though there could be any sincerely emotional connection in that room or between these people <laughs> at all and this performance of kind of turning away, humbling himself um, and coming back to him kind of with this more sincere pleading. Like I, I'm forgetting what he actually says once he turns back, but there's this like yeah. strange and everyone in the room is sort of like stunned or maybe he's mm-hmm. done this before. It kind of seems like, Oh, this is his thing that he does to kind of coerce people into some sort of collaboration with him or to give their image over to him because it feels like, Oh, well he's like a nice guy. He, he cares. He's, this isn't about money. This is about, me <laughs> what, what he says when he turns around is i lied to you i haven't oh that's right you. oh that's right so it's that's right. it's but like I now, I'm, to com- say that. now right. I'm coming clean you know yeah so you're like you're absolutely confession. right it's yeah. this right mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. false confession it's yeah. just what yeah. you were saying about the artifice of artifice mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah of, of, uh exactly um I, I, he's still lying <laughs> yeah yes. Of course. Tempter. <laughs> yeah. 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 I like your, I like your take on it, Joseph. That whole scene is about temptation, right? He's being tempted mm-hmm. with money. He's being tempted with sex. He's being tempted with fame. And he is interested in fame. Very and then once yes, it starts to fame. collapse, he goes, can we get Sprite? You know, then he starts yeah. like, <laughs> what about he's Obama? He's like flailing. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Is there anything yeah. good that, uh, that I can harvest from this uh, moment? And and that takes us to the point that you were going to raise, Deb, which is about was about cancel culture. There were these there were these wonderful little um, th- things going on throughout about uh, cancel culture. Um, t- Twitter, have you have you been on Twitter? Lived experience, and he and then at some point he says, "Trauma is a trend." I was like, mm-hmm. it was it was just it was just right. so great, but. But you know that part where you guys are like, well, we might be able to get you on Rogan, or maybe there's a Jordan Peterson angle here, right, right. or something yeah. like that. It's like, oh, you, you've you've you you're now at that you're now in that place in the culture, and you can still Just, be capitalized on. Yes, right. Yes. There's still potential yeah. here, but yeah. But he and bites this idea the apple. Like, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Kate. No, no. I just was going to say this larger idea of these like communal fantasies and like can that cause harm like if you have a dream about someone if you have Mm -hmm. a terrifying dream is that harm right you know it's like right does that actually like we can wake up afraid and it's scary and dreams as we all know are deeply impactful and you can they can change the energy of your entire day or you know Mm -hmm. it's really something to shake up or wake you know wake you up in the night and you can your heart can be pounding and you can be afraid but you are safe right or then what are i mean this is i'm just sort of curious here like what what is really? Yeah, that's a great what point. Danger, that's, a gr- yeah, that's a great point. Like, because I mean, we of course would say, yeah, you've got a frightening dream. Okay, you know, let's roll our sleeves up. The psyche's trying to get your attention. You know, this yeah. is this is the healing function of the psyche at work. But all of his students were traumatized and needed yeah. cognitive behavioral therapy and and couldn't have uh, him in the room. Couldn't have him in the oh, room. So yeah. yeah, I mean, there is a kind of uh, um, inappropriate. Uh, attitude toward the unconscious throughout mm-hmm. the film that's really picked up. It, yeah, totally. It, it, it never occurs to anybody that this is my dream that features this person. And what is going on in me, it, it is absolutely taken for granted as a reality that the dream figure of, of Paul is about Paul. It is Paul. Somehow Paul has a special power. And then it gets, uh, you know, the other people won't, they won't let him see his daughter in the school play because to have him be in the audience would be so upsetting. So it's such, it, you're right, it's just such a denial of, of what internal life is like. Uh, versus uh, the external figure of Paul who has some sort of mysterious power that he injects into people and he infects people with. 
uh, it never seems to occur to anybody to do a little introspection and go, what is going on with me Mm -hmm. that I'm so upset by this? I had a bad dream. And, uh, you know, I do think there's some uh, reality to it for all of us that when we have a really powerful dream uh, with somebody that we know in the dream, uh, that we do tend to sort of think about like, oh, you know, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call up that friend and say, oh, my gosh, you know what? I dreamt about you last night. And the friend will inevitably say, what was I doing? <laughs> Or how you can wake so, up next to your partner and be like, you are so mean in my dream. You know, and you feel angry. And it's like, how could you do that? You know, and, and then, and it feels I'm, I'm real. done with There's you. I'm not, I'm not yeah. going to speak to you for a week. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and the whole world becomes psychotic in that moment. Yes. Because the definition of psychosis is that the ego and the unconscious barrier has collapsed. And whatever the unconscious sends up from the depths becomes real. I, I dreamt it, so it's real. Or I thought it, so it's real. Mm-hmm. I, I, my senses were tickled, and it must be real. So it is also a movie about this descent into a collective psychosis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how frightening that is. And in one sense, it may also be that Nicolas Cage is the only sane one in the room. <laughs> We could say that when he is when he's lamenting into the YouTube, his wife accuses him of being narcissistic, but he's also being an individual because the people that he's talking to are psychotic, and he is the reality principle in that moment. I am I have not done these things to you. I am not invading your dream like an army, and I am being injured. He is the one that, more than anyone who is being injured. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, yes, the, the wife looks at him and scorns him for not sympathizing with the people because she wants him to believe you have done things. But that's actually a lie. Well, I don't think she wants him to believe that he's done things. It's, it's more that his, I mean, what she says is that his apology is self-serving because he's like, I'm, it's all about him, 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 him. And She's been reluctant all along to have him capitalize on this. And she's been, like you said, Joseph, she's been kind of patient with him, but she also has not been a big fan of him capitalizing on it and trying to monetize it. And she's a little sick of him feeling all puffed up about it and uh, yes. that kind of thing. So, Well, I think that the suggestion that he should apologize, who does that come from? I think it comes from her. Who says that apologizing is the way that it should go? Because that again, that's, will you please jo- join us in the psychosis, mm-hmm. which is you are savaging the world. Yeah. And the yeah. only and the apolo- way you must admit that and confess to something that you didn't do. And I still, I still, I wish we had that film clip here. I think Cage has every right. Um, I don't think he's inflated. I think he's the mm. only human being in, in the world at that moment who mm. is distraught mm. that he is being savaged by the gods. I don't know you. Mm. I have never done these things. I've never hurt you. Uh, yeah. My life is being destroyed by this insane psychosis. Um, but I think what we see over and over again is uh, again, your analogy, I think, to Job is right on, because that's what Job does, is what I do wrong. Uh, and there are all the, you know, Job's comforters are, you know, all saying, well, you must have done something, um, which is what happens to the, to the Nicolas Cage uh, figure. Yeah, and what he's uh, done wrong it, is he hasn't taken responsibility for his right. shadow. Exactly. Kate, you. What were you going to say a minute ago? Oh, I just was going to say the that moment of the YouTube apology. The apology has become this like I don't even know what the, the word is, but it's this modern language, right. it's like this new it's like thing, yes. social right. demand, or this new thing yeah. to sort of master. And so we're so used to like, you know, people commit these sins, or you yeah. know, or become these um, figures, uh, and we 
and then they're forced to apologize. And it's like how, and that apology is judged based on its authenticity and have you properly, yeah. you know. And it's never um, authentic enough. Right, yeah. And how, yeah, your ability to kind of get on your knees and prostrate and like, and, you know, beg for your life back <laughs> or beg for mm. your image to be restored. That's sort of yeah. the, mm. um, the apology as this currency is, yeah, it feels relatively new. Yep. Yeah, that's that's a good point. It it is another place where the film kind of picks up this current social phenomenon. And so I th- I would say that in terms of the fall from grace, that it's why I think your scene is so important, Kate, in that movie. Again, it's the temptation of Christ. Yeah, 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 there, are th- right. there are several <laughs> different temptations that yeah, are yeah. offered, and really, where the dreams change is that the Nicolas Cage character bites the apple, Mm -hmm. and then that's when all the dreams change, which Mm -hmm. coincides with the idea of being thrown out of Eden, Mm -hmm. and then there is a fiery cherub that is standing at the gate of Eden that is going to attack you if you try to crawl back into Eden, and that fiery cherub shows up everywhere. that you you no longer have access mm. because if you had stayed innocent, if you had not eaten of the knowledge of good and evil, you might have been able to stay if you had just been an innocent, a, a fool, a divine mm-hmm. fool, mm-hmm. in the midst of all this, and continued saying, "I don't know, I oh, who knows." But again, he was tempted, bit the apple, Sprite, Obama, sexy <laughs> stuff, and uh, and. All of a sudden, that will mm-hmm. not stand. Mm-hmm. He lost his innocence, which then suggests that in the first half of the movie, if this, if this archetype is real relative to the movie, he was innocent. Mm-hmm. That he was truly an innocent creature in the garden, just mm-hmm. stumbling around um, in the classroom, bumbling you know, through life in a harmless maybe even sweet, awkward kind of way. But with unmet needs, with unmet narcissistic needs <laughs> that he's carrying along with him. Uh-huh. Which goes then to how we often interpret the fall from grace, which is that um, human beings or every human being needs to get thrown out of the Garden of Eden because the Garden of Eden is the infantile fantasy. Uh-huh. God is the great mother just provides everything and you don't have to think or do or know anything. It all just kind of happens. He never achieves, there's no redemption. Uh, well, mm-hmm. I well, am going to, I'm going to, I'm going to contest that because mm-hmm. when I watched it the second time around and Kate, I'd love to know your thoughts on this too. There is, you're right. There's no, there's, there's, no. there's a hint at redemption at the end. And this mm-hmm. is what I came up with is, all along, he's wanted all of this stuff without having to work for it. He's wanted to have, uh, you know, be recognized for his academic work without ever really publishing or writing a book. He's, he's wanted to have the book contract given to him, you know, just because he appears in someone's dreams doing nothing, by the way. Um, but then <laughs> once the Norio is invented, this device that lets you enter another's dreams, he gets it and he works at it. You see him watching YouTube videos. You see him practicing. He's working at something. For the first time in the film, we see him really putting effort into something. And what, what is he, what's he trying to do is enter his wife's dream to yeah. give her the fantasy she wanted. Mm-hmm. And it's the first time we see him really behaving in a kind of generous way. Yeah. You know, he's, he's lost his wife. She's left him. He's, you know, just heartbroken. And, and here he is for the first time, we, we see him really being relational, you know, and, and wanting to, you know, he appears to her, you know, in, in this David Byrne suit, you know, rescuing her, which is the yeah, fantasy that really she identified. Sweet. And that's how the film ends. So I think there's a, li- there's a lovely little hint at redemption. And what's that final um, line I'm trying to remember? They, they, they reach out for each other and he says, I wish this were real. Is that what he's right? right? That's it. Yeah. 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 And yeah, I agree, Lisa. It's like that moment is when we see him trying to kind of concoct this fantasy to appease 
his wife and get her back. And it's a loving, it's loving. It's like a loving fantasy. Yeah. It's like the first time he's not really just thinking about himself. Yeah. I think. Yeah. And yeah, his desire to kind of live out that fantasy for her, be that dream object, like the way he can't, you know, he can't become the sexual fantasy of this other woman. And mm -hmm. maybe he can become this fantasy for his wife. And yeah. 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 Uh, I, I think your point is really well taken. And, uh, you know, who knows? You know, we can tune in next year mm -hmm, and see if right. he manages. See if it worked. <laughs> see, see, see if he manages to translate it into the waking world. Right. Uh, that's, it's a nice, a nice hope. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> There's hope you know, for redemption, but we don't know if it gets there. You know, and it's still in the dream world of, uh, you know, not not in the lived world. Um, so the rede the redemption may be out there somewhere. So, Kate, did did you have interesting dreams while you worked on this film? Ah, uh, um, I'd have to consult my dream journal, but um, <laughs> which of course you keep. Yeah, which I keep in Google Drive. Feel free to hack me. Um, yeah, <laughs> I no. <laughs> <laughs> not, that I, not that I, not that I remember. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think, I'm trying to remember if I've had any dreams with celebrity figures mm -hmm. lately. How about us? I hate to say it. You haven't been in my, in my <laughs> dreams, but I don't even dream about myself. I haven't even appeared in my goddamn dreams. Um, uh, People yeah. have a lot of celebrity dreams. That's such a common thing. And it's always so fun. I'm trying to think if I had any lately. Um, uh oh, I got nothing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to, yeah. Well, I remember when you and Jung went to India, he thought he was going to have all kinds of you know, really spectacular, interesting, different dreams. And he dreamt of the most quotidian things back <laughs> mm -hmm. in Switzerland. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, they may be coming. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's funny when dreams sort of stop. Like I was having, I typically have very vivid dreams and they're mm. they feel like really intricate and they're long and a lot happens. And then there was a period where I just stopped and I, and I sort of was like, Oh, but, but my interpretation was like, it's because I'm integrated. You know, I was like, I'm like, I'm living in an integrated <laughs> way right now. You know? And I do think it, it felt very deliberate. Like my dreams mm -hmm. were being held back by something. It was like, okay, mm -hmm. enough of this. Cause I had been so kind of obsessively um, thinking about my dreams and writing about them and really finding them to be very like fertile. But yeah, um, yeah they felt like they were being, like almost intentionally like stop now you just are going to live a little bit yeah do you, yeah and do you i mean do you find mm -hmm. that there's a kind of ebb and flow between your creative work and your dreams because sometimes i think that if we're really outputting a lot creatively it's almost like well that's where all that psychic energy goes to mm. totally maybe yeah i definitely have the sort of classic um i just came off of a run of doing my show and i would have the dreams of like I don't know my lines, you know, oh, or geez. just, you know, you get out there and you freeze. And then, but there are even moments in like waking life, performance is such a dream. Particularly, I was just doing theater. Mm. So it's like, that is such a dream space. And there are times when you are on stage and you're sort of like, is this real? Like they, it kind of feels unreal because mm. it is such an unreal position. Like you're standing there, you're in the dark, everyone's staring at you. It's like, and it does take on in moments, almost this like out of body kind of like, okay, I guess I'll do this now. And your body sort of takes over and goes into wow. the, it knows oh, what wow. to do. And you can be talking wow. and performing and you're, you are completely thinking about something else. Or you're like, ah. it's, um, I've had it only, I've had it a few times, maybe once or twice, it was disturbing to me and I felt almost dissociative, kind of like, yeah, I can think of two times I didn't like it. It kind of mm. freaked me out. but. That does happen. You really feel like the body take over and kind of do this thing in your kind of next to yourself, watching yeah, yourself. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can imagine that. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. 
I know Joseph is the other, is the thespian in our group. I'm mm-hmm. wondering if, if that's Joseph. The under-actualized thespian. <laughs> so. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> But but you're what we're talking about, and the film talks about, you know, how uh, we have all kinds of parts to us. Uh, yep. Jung called it the dissociative nature of the psyche, that mm. we have all these things. We have muscle memory and dreams, and, you know, one part is doing this, and the other part of me is thinking that. And uh, yeah. uh, we like to think we're far more... Uh, unitary as beings uh, than we really are. It takes us by surprise sometimes. Yeah. Well, Kate, tell us uh, where, tell the listeners where uh, they can find you. I, I'm sure yeah. you have a website and also you have a podcast. So just tell us a little oh. bit more about that. We'll also you put know, it in the show notes. I did start a podcast in COVID as, as some of us did. Um <laughs> <laughs> with one of my best friends, Jacqueline Novak, who has an amazing Netflix special you should watch called Get On Your Knees that you would all love. Okay. Oh, um, okay. It's like highly essayistic, brilliant. Like mm. She's okay. in, truly a genius. Um, and we started a podcast called Poog, which is goop backwards, which kind of came out of our <laughs> um, interest and obsession with wellness, and but kind of also this idea of this search for um you know kind of, it's sort of there are a few things at work here but i think sort of like the 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 attachment to products makeup beauty this kind of endless search and this sort of oh, almost yes. this idea of like preparing to never arrive like you're never going to find the face cream that changes your life and you're never going to and, but, oh. but isn't it kind of fun to think <laughs> that search is actually That's great we, we sort That's of great. like to lift up that search as being because it's often trivial trivialized as sort of like feminine obsession with like yeah you know and it's like no like this is actually profound this is what if we actually re approach this as a more um cerebral act and this um kind of existential obsession and yeah it's a quest yeah yeah it's definitely a, a quest mm-hmm. and um yeah and it's very it's it's a deeply raw kind of essentially unedited not to disparage our editor but um it's a very it's truly just a conversation between us and and um sometimes it goes to places that um i think are kind of profound and sometimes it kind of dwells in this like we're just kind of can't stop talking about kelp noodles or something you know and these sorts of like fascinations and um how they lodge and this uh, a recurring theme is a sort of like trying to find a routine and wouldn't my life if i woke up every day and meditated like i had you know it's like i'm going to meditate for 20 minutes and i'm going to write in my journal and then i'm going to make mm-hmm. this breakfast and then i'm going to do yoga and if mm-hmm. i do that then i can be then i'll be my optimized self and then i'll be able to find the strength to write my book you know or and mm-hmm. then i'll be the fully integrated like this this um and how hard it is to adhere to these structures and why and and yeah. the importance of trying but also the importance and kind of like having a loose grip on that self that optimized self that's like always yeah. hovering and that's very much you know now in the culture this um the culture kind of demands that you do that and how dare you not be this optimized healthy self Ugh, yeah i appreciate that about you about your conversations <laughs> is because it's that war between the ego and the unconscious mm-hmm. but how that's resolved and I've, I've seen this in some of your episodes that you were looking for the telos that mm-hmm. even looking for the, the special tea or the product that I can use, that there's meaning in this somehow, that it is not meaningless. Totally. Yeah, it is ultimately the search for God. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Through face creams. I mean, truly, yeah. Well, yeah, and, really. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Which is why archetypally, you know, millions of people will, will move towards a particular product because there is a there is a, a transcendental or archetypal promise mm-hmm. that is connected Which to you, and you guys are talking about that. Especially when it's an attached to a person, right? This beautiful woman uses this, you know, and, and so I'm going to use that, and then I'm going to essentially ingest her and become her. I mean, it's so real, and mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. still, you know, am, like, searching for these products whose ideas are like, what, what does this one person do? What's their routine that I could 
you know, co-opt and then transform and become this whole other self. Um, so that's called Poog. You can find it wherever you find podcasts. Right. Um, yeah, I have a stand-up special on Hulu. You did such a glorious reading of my <laughs> my bio up top. So feel free to rewind to the beginning, folks. But uh, you can well, you can find me. I exist. Yeah, right. And we'll put we'll put some links in the show notes too. But thank you so much for joining us. This was just a oh. ton of fun. I think I feel like we all had so much to say. We were just kind of popping know, off. It's, so it's truly hell to jump off. I really do. And I'm. Have you done an episode on on phone addiction? I feel like you've talked. Is there a full no. episode just about no. that? Oh, so as no. you're talking, like, that. please, please help okay. us. <laughs> I think what's that's your, such. What's a, your take yeah. on that? What's what's please, please the hope that it has us. for you? I mean, this is really my obsession, but also my current obsession is sort of like how to talk about this thing because we all, it's so universal, right? There's this mm-hmm. understanding of we're all on our phones too much. And then the, the conversation sort of stops there. And it's like, I feel like we haven't really reckoned with what's been lost, which is so overwhelming yeah. and so devastating. Yeah. Yes. And I feel it. I mean, I was talking to my, my friend John Early, who I make a lot of comedy with, and we're kind of constantly like, well, we just, our youth, we just gave it to Instagram, you know, to uh, the hours logged. I mean, and, and I really find for myself, and I've gone through periods. I actually have two phones now. I have one phone that has social media on it. And then I have my normal phone so that I can't, when I go out in the world, I don't have social media with me. Hmm. But, and that has helped a lot. But I, I mean, we need 12 step for this. I mean, it's like, I truly am powerless. It's like, if I just have my phone, I will scroll forever. And that, um, hmm. that, that desire hmm. to just block out and just go into this other realm. And hmm. I just feel like we don't even have I know people, I mean, I've read a couple of books. People talk about how to, oh, you should be on your phone less. And again, we all know this. And oh, these companies are, you know, we are laborers. We're, it's free labor for these other, for these companies. And, the, you know, we, we donate our lives. And, our, and I really feel, too, I mean, it's just devastating. My own, um, now it feels exotic to just sort of mm. go, I'm going to go out on the deck and not bring my phone. And kind of just like yeah, stare. And it's like, where, and I think about this a lot. Like, where do ideas come from? Like, they don't come yep. from your phone. They come from yeah. just kind of <laughs> staring or thinking. This and kind of fallow time. Yeah, and yeah. how it's so... Actually, I don't think he'll mind me saying this. Chris Borgley, um, who made the movie, he has such yeah. a dedicated... He, when he's writing, he takes his internet modem, he puts it in his car, he drives his car oh my God. to... A location he parks it and then he does a long walk that's like his like morning walk back to his house oh. ah. and that's how he gets work done and i found that i was like that is so correct like that's almost the only way to do it you have to physically rip yourself away from this thing and i've gone through periods i do like oh, a month here a month there where i go i'm not going to look at social media and the strange thing is you don't miss it which is almost the most disturbing element i find maybe a couple of times you're like, oh, I kind of want, and you're like, no, like you just don't need it. And somehow when you're in the system, it is, um, I forgot who yeah. said, I like read, like someone said this where I was like, if you spend um, a day off Instagram, you miss everything. If you spend a year off Instagram, you miss nothing. Oh yeah. Oh, and it's like, yeah. that is kind of what it feels like. And so I think they're, you know, yeah, it's sort of the conversation that no one's really having because I think it's also just so disturbing when you really reckon with what's, what we've lost and what we're losing. Yeah. Well, and what's the draw on that deep unconscious level? And what is the archetype that is so powerful that it can grab a world mm-hmm. and command yeah, their and, attention? And what else, like, when you think about, like, well, what would you give your life to? What would you give your waking mm-hmm. hours to? And we would think it would be to, our loved ones or, you know, to deepen our relationship with our, ourselves or our work. And it's like, no, we just sort of give yeah, it over every day to this thing. And yeah, we can't rip ourselves out of it. And, um, and even people I, who I know who I've always admired for their work ethic and their ability to focus, they're like, oh, I can't watch a movie anymore without looking at mm-hmm. this. Or I can't mm-hmm. read. Mm-hmm. I mean, for myself, wow. I'm like, I think about, yeah, the way I used to be able to, and even, and it, did sometimes hurt it was hard like it is hard to read a challenging text and to really sit there and yep. grapple with it and that's and we're losing that yeah. ability to do that i'm likening it to the nicholas cage character in the movie we're easily seduced mm-hmm. 
Uh, yeah, I we guess, get, yeah. we're very easily seduced to um, something that has immediate gratification. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get a little, we get all the little dopamine hits or whatever from uh, social media and screens and video games and, 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 and Nicolas Cage got uh, the same kind of thing from his unearned, sudden, unexpected fame. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and then thinking about dreams and what's so disturbing, of course, is the phone. It's it's you know it's an algorithm, right? So you only see what it's showing you only what it thinks you want to see or what you have seen before. So there actually is no a dream. Like there's no. It's also like the death of mm-hmm. the future in a way, or a death. Like you you the also phone's the never going to show surprise. you anything new. Yeah, right. Exactly. Say again? The death of surprise. Yes, completely. And then it's even more disturbing now when you see children on it. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't have kids, so I can kind of be over here and go, I would never allow my child. <laughs> but it's like, but it's really it's disturbing when you think about it. like, who are these kids now who mm-hmm. are, who are going, who are now just watching this all day. It's like children are supposed to sort of like be imaginative and like have like, where will anything new come from? Because, yep. and, and there is this feeling of like, is. there's nothing new. Yeah. This goes to the uh, psychology of play. Yeah. And that when we're, and this is so strange to me that kids who are even doing these video games, that they will watch other kids doing the oh, games. Oh, I know. So, I mean, <laughs> it's extraordinary. Guys, I'm scared. Yeah. That is so <laughs> dark. Yeah. Yeah. But, but what is play and the mm-hmm. psychology of play? And what does it mean to have that intruded upon? And, Say in another twenty years, thirty years, you're you're going to lose an entire generation of people, myself included, who are the only ones who remember what it was like before laptops and iPhones existed. Uh-huh. I know, I know. I don't think I, w- I I I was talking about this. I'm like, would I have started doing stand up? You know, it's like these things. Like, I would not. I certainly wouldn't be who I am, or I wouldn't. I don't think I would have cultivated mm-hmm. any of the things that. I'm so glad that I did if I had had a phone, if I had been given social media when I was, I mean, forget 16, 10 or eight. I mean, or, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, who knows? It's, I mean, there's a serious, it's a disaster. (laughs) We've lost so much more than we've gained. I, I, I think you're it's a great you're right about that. Yes, yeah, we yeah. promise that we will put that on our list. I need that from you you and I need the performer episode and okay and we'll do it yeah. uh yeah uh, an episode okay. on the psychology of performers so. oh that would be great that yeah that would be great well I'll we, listen we owe you that oh so. i need that that's an emergency yeah great <laughs> okay maybe we can have you back on when we do the episode on the performer Any that would be time. wonderful oh, i would to have you, you three i'll i'll tell you anything yeah. you can invite us on poog oh. we'll talk about our favorite facial you'll products. be the you'll be the first <laughs> poog guest i know truly yeah. Uh, well, right. I'm. Thank you I'm so, so much, happy to thank you for having me. It's so such a pleasure to meet you. And yeah, whenever you want, I'm back. I'm back. Okay, great. great. <laughs> Today's streamer is a woman. She's 44 years old. She's a teacher, and. Her She entitled her dream, In Another Time, and here's the dream. I'm a passenger in a moving car. The driver notices that we are going through a bad area and begins to close the car windows with a second layer of window, a dark sort of armor that comes standard in these future cars. She is closing the windows when I realize it was too late to close mine. A young boy comes through the still-open gap in my window. He lands on my lap, and he has a metallic stick that's like a toothbrush, but instead of bristles, it has spikes. This is part of a scam that is known in this future environment. These bristles will be used to poke me, to infect me with something horrible. If I am so scared that I open the door to eject this child, There are people waiting outside to attack our vehicle and to hurt us all in ways that could be even worse. Even in the dream, I begin to ponder what infection, 
in my past led me to this sad life where I'm about to be infected. The past and future are jumbled. If I had made better choices, could I have had a better life? Could I have been a better person? I see all of my missed opportunities, and it's as if I accept that my life was already infected before I face whatever infection will come of these bristles. But I won't open the car door. So for context, the dreamer says, I've been reflecting a lot on my life lately, which I do in the dream as well. And she says the main feelings in the dream were, this felt scary, and I was sort of bracing myself to accept all of that within the dream. And she adds, I'm not in a recognizable time or place, and I recognize no person in the dream. Okay. So what do we make of this? complex stream. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, one of the things that came up for me when I was sitting with it um, was that there is an image of psychological defense in this dream. So there are these armor windows that come up when you're in a bad area. So it's the way that we shield ourselves from, we, you know, we have defenses against things you know, in the outer world, we can shield ourselves against attack or shield ourselves against, you know, bad opinions of ourselves or become defensive with another person. But defenses also work in the inner world. So we might defend against, uh, for example, new information that the unconscious wants to bring to our attention that might upset our ego's equilibrium. And I, I think of these windows as being an example of that. And then there's a young boy that comes through the, the window, and I can't help but imagining that that's a positive thing. You know, children in dreams are usually positive. They usually carry the sense of, of mm-hmm. new life that's developing. And, uh, and, it, and I think it's positive that the dreamer is not going to eject the child and is willing to take whatever's going to come from this encounter. I find myself visualizing this toothbrush with spikes on it and, and wondering mm. if such an object even exists um, or something reminiscent of that that the psyche has, I don't know, seen at some time or has some kind of value. Well, there's the idea of injection. And, you know, what can be injected can be medicine or sometimes it can be poison. And sometimes those two things are one and the same, actually. Uh, you know, so, sometimes uh, something that's actually toxic in high doses is the thing that heals in a small enough dose, for example. And, and so an injection, you know, is also what a snake does when it bites us or a spider. So there's the notion that when we are injected with something, we are changed on an inner level and, uh, and we have to submit to it. And I think that this, this dreamer understands that she has to admit to it, she has to submit to it. And in a sense, it, it, it might in, involve a kind of death or, or suffering, but that that is the price of being changed. And, and she's not, fortunately, she's not, um, too defended against what the psyche wants to bring to her attention. She can allow the new life in and allow it to change her. I have a, um, something I'd love to share. Okay. So (laughs) I knew that I was thinking about something now. It's certainly not a toothbrush, but I was trying to figure out what medical devices might have spikes on them and how might that be relevant. And uh, because I have um, idiopathic neuropathy in my feet, so uh, I'm familiar with these sensory pinwheels. They're very sharp. They they could pierce the skin, but they're not meant to, but they are intense. And so the neurologist will will rake it over my foot and I will feel it, but I'll have no pain. And then it'll get right above what would be a sock level. And then all of a sudden I'm like, ow. Wow. 
And、um, it tests this line between、um, ordinary and、mm. reduced sensory levels.、Mm. And if it was misused, of course, it really could really jab that into someone. But so I had this fantasy that、um, while she would imagine the spikes could only be used to break her skin, there may be other reasons. And one of the things is. Are you sensitive enough,、mm. or where are you lacking、um, adequate sensitivity, and where are you more sensitive? So it's a way of giving testing stimulus、mm-hmm. response, and I don't know if that's exactly what the dream is, but it offers a, another lens because、mm-hmm. the dream ego is often, I don't know, as it is for all of us, it jumps to conclusions, it gets worried,、yeah. right? But、um, She's there, wanting to put armor around, which means I am not going to feel anything.、Hmm. And then this little sprite, so to speak, comes、uh-huh. in with a little neurologic pinwheel, saying, "Ah, well, let's test how sensitive you are, and various yeah, yeah. places in your body、yeah. where your armor hasn't had a chance to lock you in."、Uh, that's that's really interesting. Yeah. And I think our dream ego gets it at the end in、uh, in a way、um, where she says, you know, she's kind of doing a little life review. If I'd made better choices, you know, would I have had a better life? Would I have been a better person? I see all my missed opportunities, and it's as if I accept that my life was already infected. Presumably by her missed opportunities and poor choices, before I face whatever infection will come of these bristles, and I won't open the car door. So there's there the dream ego is aware of the telos of the dream of where is this going,、mm-hmm. and in the dream she talks about past and future, and this is a future car, and so on. So. There's something in the dream that is aware that this is going somewhere. There is something purposeful about it. And what if she was already infected?、Mm. Uh, and the difference between、uh, you know something curative and a poison is often in the dosage.、S- snake venom is used medicinally when it's diluted. I would also love to read the dream again, but just replace the word "infect" with "affect." <laughs> is, is, Try it. Go.、Yeah. Go for it. I'm a passenger in a moving car. The driver notices that we're going through a bad area and begins to close the car windows with a second layer of window, a dark sort of armor that comes standard in these future cars. She's closing the windows when I realize it's too late to close mine. A young boy comes in. Through the still open gap in my window, he lands on my lap and has a metallic stick. It's like a toothbrush, but instead of bristles, it has these spikes. This is part of a scam. That's known in the future environment. Those bristles will be used to poke me, to affect me, in some horrible way.、Huh. If I am so scared that I open the door to eject the child, there are people waiting outside. To attack the vehicle and hurt us in ways that could be worse. Even in the dream, I begin to ponder what affect in my past has led me to this sad life, where I am about to be affected. <laughs> the past and future are jumbled. If I'd made better choices, would I have had a better life, been a better person? My missed opportunities. It's as if I accept that my life was already affected before、right. I face whether affectation. Will come of these bristles, but I won't open the car door. And、yeah. often we are afraid that we will be infected with it, with a kind of feeling that we is going on in the unconscious mind. I don't want to feel certain things, so I put my armor up, and、mm-hmm. then we begin to treat a feeling, an uncomfortable feeling, as if it's an, a poison or an infection, but actually. It, Could just be psychological pain of some kind that we really hope to wall off,、mm-hmm. and we know it has something to do with being bad. We're going through the bad area, and the barriers come up. So, I wonder 
whether or not she's got much access to her badness Mm -hmm. or knowledge of it at the very least. You know, there's something about um, being worried about being infected and she's already been infected that says to me that, you know, it's sort of our fate to be infected in in a sense by life or to be affected by life. Affected, right. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's a sense like, oh, it's already happened and it's happening again. And it's the, it's the inescapability of our fate. And what I, what still feels positive to me is that, you know, the streamer's not thrilled about accepting it, but she's accepting it. This is, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, what she knows is that if she rejects this fate, it's going to come out worse for her. She, she really gets that. And uh, so she's, yeah. she's prepared to take what is, you know, what is her destiny in, in essence, you know. It's also a story about getting inoculations, mm-hmm. being vaccinated. So I have been vaccinated, which is an infection previously. Mm-hmm. And so the boy comes in and he's going to vaccinate her again, but it's not safe to open the door and be exposed to all the other infections or affectations out there. I actually need to get my vaccination first. Mm-hmm. And then once I build up some immunity, then I might be able to open the door and withstand the badness, whatever that is out there. And I think of dreams as often being like vaccinations. Yeah. They give us mm-hmm. tiny little doses of something. That's great. And our psychological immune system kind of gets a little more muscular. That's I really like that, Joseph. That's really cool. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.